Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. To celebrate the observance of African American History Month, I've spent the last few weeks reading and talking about classic works of Black literature, especially books listed in the Zora canon. I'll link to the videos below. Today's video is the Black History Month edition of my continuing series, Cooking the Books, where I consider cookbooks, food, and eating. I have quite a collection of books to mention today, including two fairly traditional cookbooks, two vegan soul food cookbooks, a study of African American food and its role in culture, and a study of the history of African American cookbooks. Let's get started. First is Jubilee, Recipes from Two Centuries of African American Cooking by Tony Tipton Martin. Dee Dee at Brown Girl Reading recommended this book to me, and it is really lovely as a physical book, as a collection of recipes, and as a consideration of the role of food and cooking in African American history and culture. If you're going to pick up just one of the books I talk about today, either this one or the next cookbook I'll talk about might be the best place to start, unless you have specific dietary limitations or specific topical interests. The cookbook Jubilee is named for the idea of Jubilee in the Bible. The book starts with a quote from Leviticus about the consecration of the 50th year, when, quote, each of you is to return to your family land and to your own clan. I love the way this idea sets up the book, one where history and connection bring people together for the celebration of liberty and joy, as Biblical Jubilee promises. Author Tony Tipton Martin draws the link explicitly in her introduction. She's talking about a culinary freedom, a culinary jubilee about liberation and resilience, that is, cooking as a form of resistance. She points out that for many years, caricatures such as Aunt Jemima and Mammy have obscured the true history of talented Black cooks and a history of creative African-American cookery. Tipton Martin covers a broad sweep of recipes, from formal to casual, from beverages and salads to roasts and desserts. The recipes themselves reflect diverse global influences and also diverse class backgrounds, including the food of middle-class and well-to-do Black families. As the author points out in the extensive introduction, she's interested in a large story of African-American food, one not restricted by what she calls, quote, a world that confined Black experience to poverty, survival, and soul food. Although she doesn't intend to criticize soul food, she's insistent that there's a broad range of African American cuisine, and she bristles when people assume it's a monolith. I love the fact that Jubilee includes delicious sounding modern recipes, but also gives many clips of similar older recipes, many of which seem more similar to the food I grew up eating along the coast of South Carolina when I was young. I was especially pleased to see a recipe from 1930 for Russian tea, a regular part of my family's celebration of the winter holidays to this day. In addition to the historical recipes, Tipton Martin includes histories of the development of various foods and recipes, not for every single recipe, but for many. And these sections are not just tiny little romanticized paragraphs. She's gone through a great number of old cookbooks, as well as through interviews with former slaves recorded in the 1930s by the Federal Writers Project, among others. In other words, the food she presents comes with a powerful side of history and culture. On a side note, some of the older recipes are rather unusual, at least to me. Homemade coffee, for example, involves baking cornmeal, bran, molasses, and water together into a cake, then grinding the baked cake and using those grounds instead of ordinary coffee. 
I bookmarked many recipes to try. Not that one, but her modern recipes. I'm eager to try the peanut soup with garlic and black pepper, an okra salad modeled on a traditional Brazilian salad, the sweet potato salad with parsley, green onions, and pecans, collard greens with cornmeal dumplings, and peach buttermilk ice cream. Is it time for dinner yet? The second cookbook I'll mention is Sweet Home Cafe, a celebration of African-American cooking put out by the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Like Jubilee, Sweet Home Cafe recognizes the influence of the African diaspora, as well as the impact of surrounding food cultures on what has become the diversity of African-American cuisine today. And like Jubilee, Sweet Home Cafe is concerned with connecting recipes and history. In this book, though, there's a little more connection with non-culinary history, or less explicit culinary history. For example, there's a picture of the Greensboro lunch counter protest during the Civil Rights Movement, and a discussion of the Green Book Handbook for African Americans seeking to find dining establishments and lodging as they traveled in the U.S. South during the era of segregation. Like Jubilee, and like most cookbooks, Sweet Home Cafe presents everything from soups to desserts, including beverages and pickles and assorted snacks. There are also two nice little sections at the end. One is a page of suggested menu ideas, combining various recipes from the book to help you put together a Juneteenth feast, or a Carolina fish fry, or a Sunday midday dinner. The other section is a recipe list organized by region, whether you want to cook from the Creole coast surrounding New Orleans, from the Upper South, from areas heavily settled during the Great Migration, or even from African diaspora communities outside the States. In general, the recipes in Sweet Home Cafe are a little less formal than the recipes in Jubilee, quicker and easier to prepare. Many of the foods are absolutely classic soul food recipes, which also means they're classic foods for all Southerners, black and white. I'm especially thrilled with a section on pickle making, including two of my favorites, spicy pickled okra and sweet pickled watermelon rind. A good recipe for spicy pimento cheese is included, and the idea of black-eyed pea hummus sounds great, even though I hesitate a little about the authenticity of that name. Finally, I was flooded with nostalgia when I came across the recipe for banana pudding ringed with vanilla wafers. Unlike the kind I grew up with, this one is flavored with bourbon. The next two cookbooks are both vegan soul food books. The first by the amazing chef, cookbook author, and food justice activist, Bryant Terry. His book is titled Vegan Soul Kitchen, Fresh, Healthy, and Creative African-American Cuisine. I love this book. Yes, he gives some similar kinds of historical and cultural background that you could find in Jubilee or Sweet Home Cafe, but he also peppers his lists of recipes with a chosen soundtrack for each recipe, a favorite R&B song and occasionally a suggestion for a film or visual art. Unlike the first two books, it isn't full of glorious, full-colored food photography, although there is a little section of inspiring photos in the middle of the book. Terry eats a vegan diet for a lot of reasons, and he hopes his book will be useful to all people, vegan or not. I'm truly moved by his statement that he wants to shift... African American cuisine back to the traditions of his grandparents and earlier generations, home gardens and kitchens. He sees too many people in the African American community as well as the nation as a whole diagnosed with what he calls diet related illness, including hypertension and diabetes. The globalized food system has also done a lot of economic damage to the communities. He wants to present a different way. 
And on top of that kind of thinking is Terry's commitment to making ecological choices with his diet and his cooking. One of my favorite examples is an early section in the book called Zero Waste Watermelon. That is one watermelon with six recipes, juice and flesh and rind to use the entire watermelon. I also love the collard confetti made by sauteing finely sliced ribs from leafy greens rather than just composting them or throwing them away. The second vegan soul food cookbook is by the YouTube sensation Jenny Claiborne, and it's called Sweet Potato Soul, 100 Easy Vegan Recipes for the Southern Flavors of Smoke, Sugar, Spice, and Soul. Her book is lovely, full of what are often gorgeous pictures of whole food or relatively simple presentations, making it clear how fulfilling this kind of food can be. One of my favorite recipes includes creamy grits topped with a stew of zucchini, artichoke hearts, tomatoes, and Old Bay seasoning. Another, coconut collard salad with pickled onions. I've been making pulled barbecue made from jackfruit for a while, and I'm eager to try Claybird's recipe for crab cakes made with heart of palm rather than crab meat. Many of the recipes in Sweet Potato Soul sound both fantastic and doable, but there are moments when her sweet potato shtick seems a bit much. An abnormally high proportion of her recipes include the orange tuber. Still, Several of those recipes do call my name, including sweet potato tahini cookies, which include the sesame paste as a replacement for butter. The last two books I'll mention are not cookbooks per se, but are about the traditions of cooking and food. One is the Jemima Code, two centuries of African-American cookbooks by the same author who put together Jubilee, Tony Tipton Martin. This book is gorgeous, full of amazing photographs of everything from old cookbooks to recipe boxes and the like. The author considers more than 150 cookbooks prepared by black cooks and chefs starting in 1827 up through relatively contemporary works. The books are arranged chronologically, and Tipton Martin gives us a narrative of how each book contributes to the cultural history of the role African-Americans and African-American cuisine played in the development of American food traditions as a whole. And finally, the last book is The Cooking Gene, a journey through African-American culinary history in the Old South by Michael Twitty, a book I mentioned when I did the Soul Lit tag, which I'll link to below. I haven't finished it yet, and I suspect I might talk more about it soon, but let me say that this book mixes culinary history with both much broader political and social history, and with personal memoir. Twitty writes about the origins of African American cuisine, but what he's really exploring is the echo of race and racism across the history of the South and how to use food and the history of food traditions as a way to heal a nation. As he says, I'm not celebrating slavery. I'm celebrating how enslaved people survived. Healing in the black community, in the South as a whole, and in the nation as a whole can start to happen through reconnecting what he calls the culinary culture of the enslaved, our common ancestors, and restoring their names on the roots of the southern tree and the table those roots support. Thanks for joining me today. See you soon on Hannah's Books.